Welcome to the Maternal Resuscitation ESMO-E tutorial. The aims include to understand the issues related to maternal collapse, to learn how to conduct a successful maternal resuscitation and to achieve competence in these skills. Managing maternal cardiac arrest is an extremely challenging clinical scenario as there are two potential patients, the mother and the fetus. In the event of maternal collapse, resuscitation of the mother takes priority over fetal well-being. Although most features of a maternal resus are similar to a standard adult resus, understanding the physiological changes of pregnancy is essential for effective resus techniques. Maternal collapse is an acute event involving the cardiopulmonary systems and or the brain resulting in a reduced or absent conscious level at any stage in pregnancy and up to six weeks post-delivery. When trying to identify the cause of maternal collapse, this can be done in a variety of ways. It can be done in a system approach, according to the diagram in this slide. It can be done with the acronym BOTROPS, which we will cover later. And in this slide, I will go through four H's, four T's, and E. The first H is hypoxia. Is it a failed intubation, obstructed airway, airway aspiration, asthma, anaphylaxis, uh, amniotic fluid embolism, pulmonary edema, post-cardiac events, or related to preeclampsia? The second H is hypovolemia. Is the patient in shock? Could it be massive hemorrhagic shock, either obstetric related or non-obstetric related? Can it be distributive shock? Is there sepsis, a high spinal block, anaphylaxis in this patient, or cardiogenic shock? The third H is hypo or hyperkalemia, or other electrolyte abnormalities such as magnesium, calcium, sodium, or glucose. The fourth H is hypothermia. So you should be able to check the temperature of your patient. The first T is thromboembolism. This could also lead to obstructive shock. Does the patient have an MI, pulmonary embolism, air embolism, amniotic fluid embolism? The second T is toxicity. Is it iatrogenic from local anesthetic toxicity, magnesium related, from management of imminent eclampsia or from opiates? Is it substance misuse or endocrine disturbances causing this issue? Is it tamponade, aortic dissection, peripartum cardiomyopathy or trauma? Tension pneumothorax can also be related to trauma and internox use. And then finally, the E for eclampsia or preeclampsia. And this will also include in any intracranial hemorrhage that might have occurred. So what are the physiological changes of pregnancy that affect resuscitation? We will cover this in an A, B, C approach. Airway. Pregnant patients are at higher risk of regurgitation and aspiration due to the progesterone effects on the lower esophageal sphincter and the effects of raised intra-abdominal pressure from a gravid uterus. During labor, opioid administration can also cause a delay in gastric emptying. Difficult intubation is also more likely in pregnant females due to weight gain, large breasts, and laryngeal edema. Breathing. Progesterone increases respiratory drive, leading to an increase in tidal volume and minute volume. Splinting of the diaphragm from the gravid uterus leads to a drop in FRC and this makes ventilation more difficult. The decrease in the FRC and the increased oxygen consumption can lead to rapid desaturation. Development of pulmonary edema can also lead to rapid desaturation and difficulty in breathing. From 20 weeks gestational age, the gravid uterus causes a autocaval compression in the supine position, 
which leads to a 30 to 40 percent reduction in cardiac output. Increased cardiac outputs and the hyperdynamic circulation of pregnancy can lead to rapid blood loss and plasma volume. Blood loss is less tolerated due to the increased plasma volume, which leads to a dilutional anemia of pregnancy. So what is your approach to a critically ill or collapsed obstetric patient? Hazard, don appropriate PPE. Hello, check if your patient is responsive. If responsive, put in the left lateral position, assess vitals and identify cause. If unresponsive, call for help and proceed. Open the airway, check for any obvious obstruction, can do an airway maneuver in order to open the airway as depicted in the diagram on the right. A head tilt chin lift, place one hand on the forehead and lift your chin up. Or jaw thrust, put your fingers at the angle of the jaw and lift your jaw forward. You would then assess for breathing. If breathing normally, put in the left lateral position, assess vitals and identify cause and give supplemental oxygen. If not breathing and no pulse, commence CPR immediately. If the patient has a pulse but no effective breathing, do gentle mask ventilation. Give rescue breaths every six seconds. And the picture on the right depicts two techniques of effective mask ventilation. The one hand C and E technique and the two-hand the technique for mask ventilation. Gentle mask ventilation can also be achieved with an oropharyngeal airway. The pictures on the right depict the appropriate measurement technique for the appropriate size OP airway, and the second picture is showing the insertion technique for an OP airway. CABD approach to the management of maternal cardiac arrest. CAB done in this order. Early chest compressions and early defibrillation improves outcomes. So in a confirmed cardiac arrest, start high quality CPR. Place hands in the center of the chest. Compressions to be done at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute. Push hard to a depth of 5 centimeters and ensure full chest recoil. Minimize interruptions. Compression ventilation ratio of 30 is to 2. Switch compressors every 2 minutes. Use a firm backboard. Place the patient supine and displace the uterus manually. A autocable decompression is required with manual left uterine displacement continuously. IV access should be established above the diaphragm to ensure that IV therapy is not obstructed by the gravid uterus. Ensure two wide bore IV lines. Assess for hypovolemia and give a fluid bolus when required. Caution should be exercised in the context of preeclampsia and eclampsia. This picture depicts both the one-handed and the two-handed technique of manual left uterine displacement. So analyze the rhythm and rapid defibrillation is required whenever it is indicated. Same recommended protocols should be used in the pregnant patient as in the non-pregnant patient. Defibrillated with biphasic shock energy of 120 to 200 joules. Compressions must be resumed immediately after the delivery of the electric shock. Anterior lateral defibrillator pad placement is recommended and the lateral pad should be placed under the breast tissue. Part of the algorithm, so once you've analyzed the rhythm, no shock is advised in PEA and asystole. Shock is advised in VF and EVT. Airway in the CAB Open the airway as discussed earlier. Insert an OP airway if required. And difficult airway will be anticipated in all obstetric patients. 
So the most experienced provider is preferred for any advanced airway management. And cricoid pressure is not routinely recommended. B in the CAB. So gentle bag mass ventilation with 100% oxygen at 15 liters per minute. Seal mask to ensure no leak around the mask. A two-handed technique is preferred. Deliver each rescue breath over one second. Give two breaths for every 30 compressions. Drugs to be used in a maternal resus. Recommended ACLS and ACA drugs and doses to be used without any modification. No medication should be withheld for fetal concerns. Administer one milligram of adrenaline every three to five minutes. Refractory VF or VT, amiodarone 300 milligrams rapid infusion should be administered followed by 150 milligrams. Or lignocaine 1.5 milligrams per kg initially followed by 0.5 milligrams per kg to a max dose of 3 milligrams per kg. If the patient is receiving IV magnesium pre-arrest, stop the magnesium and give IV calcium chloride or calcium group in it. If local anesthetic toxicity is suspected, stop injecting and give intralipid 20%. Advanced airway management, secure airway as early as possible because of the risk of aspiration. Intubation to be performed by the most experienced provider. Size 6 to 7 endotracheal tube is recommended. Ventilate at 8 to 10 breaths per minute. Monitor with capno and minimize interruptions in chest compressions during any advanced airway management. Revising the algorithm for a failed intubation is essential. So optimally, no more than two laryngoscopy attempts should be made. Supraglottic airway is a preferred rescue strategy for a failed intubation. In the event of a can't intubate, can't oxygenate scenario, emergency front of neck access, either cricothyroidotomy or scalpel bulgy tube is required. Prolonged intubation attempts should be avoided to prevent deoxygenation, prolonged interruptions in chest compressions, airway trauma, and bleeding. During a recess, you always want to see is there any reversible cause for this cardiac arrest. So the acronym BOCHOPS is used. B is bleeding or DIC. E, embolism. A, anesthetic complications, U, uterine atony, C, cardiac disease, H, hypertension, which includes preeclampsia and eclampsia, O, other differential diagnosis as per the standard ACLS guidelines, so that's your H's and your T's, P, placenta abruptural previa, and S, sepsis. So at the beginning, I mentioned that there are two patients here, the mum and the baby. During resuscitation, fetal assessment should not be performed. Any fetal monitors should be removed, detached as soon as possible to facilitate a perimortem C-section without any delay. So should a perimortem C-section be performed? In women over 20 weeks gestation, a perimortem seizure should be initiated four minutes after the cardiac arrest with the aim for delivery in five minutes. The perimortem seizure should be performed at the location where the arrest occurred because transporting the mother to theatre results in significant delays. Necessary equipment like scalpels and umbilical cord clamps must be available on recess trolleys where maternal collapse can occur. The team must not wait for special surgical equipment to begin the procedure. Only a scalpel is required. Continue CPR throughout the procedure and afterwards to ensure chances of a successful 
neonatal and paternal outcome. Continuous manual left uterine displacement should be performed throughout the caesar until the fetus is delivered. Emergency preparedness is important for maternal cardiac risk and the decision for the perimortem caesar should be made by the institution with drills to ensure effectiveness and preparedness for perimortem C-sections. The clinical governance aspect of maternal resus must not be forgotten. Accurate documentation is essential in all cases. Maternal death notification forms need to be completed as soon as possible. Continued drill and life support training improves resus skills and improves outcomes. And debriefing is recommended for the patient, the family, and the staff involved in the event. So hopefully you now feel more equipped to deal with the maternal resuscitation at your hospital. All healthcare practitioners must be proactively prepared to respond to a maternal cardiac arrest. Continued education and training is paramount for successful maternal outcomes.